online communities will shape the 21st century in the way that maybe the 20th century was shaped by companies or by governments. I mean, the 21st century is going to be more online communities are going to be doing that. That is who is, that is what is driving culture. That's what's shaping culture. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of New Forum. We're super excited and honored to introduce a brilliant founder on today's podcast. Yanzi Strictly is the co-founder of MetaLabel XYZ, a growing universe of knowledge, resources, and tools that inspire creative collaboration, cooperation, and mutual support. We're going to talk with Yanzi about meta labels, escaping the creative economy, and group structures. And as always, we're powered by Newcoin Foundation, focused on fostering the expansion of decentralized social applications, also known as Social 3.0, by forming an ecosystem and a community of visionaries, creators, and investors to spark conversations on the topics of crypto, the metaverse, NFT, and everything Web3. Hey, Yancy, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate that you could um, tune in with us today. Yeah, what's up? Thanks Thanks for reaching out. I appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. So as usual, we love to you know, hear about our amazing guests. So we can start with you sharing a bit about your story and you know, what led to you uh, founding uh, Meta Labels? A little bit about like the vision behind it and the impact you're making in this space. Yeah, my my background is originally as a as a writer. My first career was as a music journalist, reviewing records for Pitchfork and Spin Magazine and Village Voice. And I uh, started a record label back in the day. And in the midst of that, made a new friendship that turned into the creation of Kickstarter. Um, I'm one of three founders of Kickstarter. We pioneered, uh, introduced crowdfunding to the world. And I, I then spent uh, 12 years of my life um, dedicated to Kickstarter, the last four of those as CEO. And with Kickstarter, we, we was just inspired to give creators the opportunity to fund projects without a middleman's approval, um, letting them go direct to the public letting them set their own vision. And you know now it's like six and a half billion dollars, I think that's moved through Kickstarter to creative projects in the last 12 years. So a huge, huge volume uh, and you know close to 200,000 projects I think have been made through the site to date. And then in 2017, I, I stepped down as CEO and um, I then spent a couple of years on a, working on a book called This Could Be Our Future. And the book is, a uh, it's a critique of the financialization of society. And a lot of what we were inspired by with Kickstarter was trying to create a company that wasn't just driven by a bottom line, but was like quite mission driven and tried to take a responsibility to its wider community very seriously. We became a public benefit corporation, which is a corporate type that has greater responsibilities than a typical corporation. Um, and so I spent a couple of years like wanting to talk about the challenges of financialization and also to, to argue for and introduce a tool for a more pluralistic vision of value. Like with Kickstarter, there was, of course, there's value in money and being able to pay yourself, being able to do the things you want to do, but there's also so much value in community. There's value in standing by your moral beliefs. There's, there's value in supporting others. All these things are a part of like what make life worth living and what make us feel good and what makes for a vibrant society and why we want to live in some places and not others are all tied into these things. But yet every metric system we have ultimately has money at the end of it. Uh, and that, that determines its choices. And so while I was researching this book and researching like what are practical paths that can result in a more pluralistic world where value is not simply pegged to financial value and this led me to public ledgers and this led me to blockchains as an instrument for uh, ascribing any form of value to any object that could be digitally recognized, to allowing a, something to be made available according to need or some action someone has taken before. 
Uh, and basically I saw it as just a, a space that allowed you to, to reset a value system and to design a value system from the ground up. And it really felt to me that just the, the infrastructure of a public ledger as a blockchain just felt like a practical tool that can result in a lot of the things that I'm personally inspired by. Um, so that, that, that made me just really pay a lot of attention and think a lot about the space and uh, begin talking to a lot of people in the space. And then MetaLabel itself began about a year ago, where after writing the book, the book, uh, my book, This Could Be Your Future, introduces a, a philosophy called bentoism, which is a, a way of seeing your life, making choices, using your time, structuring your organization in a way that reflects a more pluralistic sense of value. I was running a community based around that, um, had a couple thousand members. And about a year ago, I got really burnt out. I had a lot of great contributors. I love being with people, but overall the feeling was lonely. Um, I felt like, uh, like I didn't have a lot of partnership. I had like put myself in this position of kind of being like a, I don't know, almost like a guru. And it was kind of boring and not that exciting to me. And it made me think more and more about what it means to be a part of a, of a larger group. And it was, it was during that time that, uh, I started thinking about my early roots in music and thinking about indie record labels, early electronic record, uh, electronic labels, hip hop labels, and how these were small groups of people who were inspired by some worldview they wanted to see, like, this is the music we like, more people should like this music, or like people who like this music should have someone like us who's like helping to put out more of it. But that's like a really powerful form for groups of people to collaborate and to support some cultural outcome that they want. And like thinking about that concept of what a label is um, and thinking about this, my own feelings of feeling alone in like my online project um, led to this insight of actually there's a, there's a need for a, for a new organizational structure that we call a meta label. And a meta label is a release club where groups of people who care about the same thing, that could be they care about the environment, they care about crypto, they care about punk rock, they care about conceptual art, they care about whatever, food from where they're from. Uh, but groups of people who share the same interest can collaborate and release projects together. And it's not just each individual person um, sending sub stacks into the void and working on their individual subscriber counts, but it's a tool and a structure that encourages collaboration, that encourages people working on projects together. And by building, by building it on a foundation of a public ledger and a blockchain, uh, you're able to distribute ownership of those works. You're able to distribute the financial outcomes of those works. Um, there's a lot of uh, different pieces of that puzzle that I think become a lot easier and a lot more interesting. And so what we are doing now with MetaLabel is we are creating uh, tools and infrastructure that will let groups of people who are have some shared creative interest squad up together create a simple structure by which they operate and let them start dropping releases and we see a release as being it could be a new record it could be a video it could be a protest it could be a blog post it could be a online gallery opening you know it could be anything um, but we're providing tooling and trying to normalize just a new action of like the creator economy is single player mode. The creator economy is you being the lonely creator, grinding, trying to get your subscriber count up. Being a meta label is creativity in multiplayer mode. It's you and five other people holding hands and releasing things together, supporting each other. And based on my own creative history and the same with my co-founders and collaborators, like we, we can feel the emotional and creative resonance of that type of collaborative mode. And so our hope is that our tools and our universe will make that normal, will make that something that feels accessible to anybody, will make it sexy. Um, and you know, we'll, we've been releasing drops this year and the, the core product, the directory will be released um, in a few months. And we'll, we're, we're very excited to, to put that out into the world. This is such a great story how, how you went from Kickstarter to working with music and with independent artists and now being in the 
uh, Web3 blockchain space. And I found a tweet of yours uh, describing Meta Label. So you say, Meta Label was inspired by specific theories about what the future now holds, from post individualism to world building, as self care to decline of the creator economy as we know it. So I'm wondering, you touched a bit on like your current uh, thoughts about creative economy and how we are kind of like this individual creator. And I'm wondering, how can we? What do you think, how can we break these structures and what is a better way to establish that within the Web3 space? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I feel like COVID inspired a real acceleration of publishing and uh, acceleration of the maturation of like all of our online lives. I don't know how you all felt, but I certainly felt like a, a real ramp up in like content everywhere as we got into COVID and everyone's like, Oh shit, this is the game now. Like get your get your sub stack out, like get be the thought leader, uh, be the think boy. And you know, I feel like there was a pattern of like you watch someone do that and then and then you see them announce like okay, now I'm like um, going to start taking money through Patreon or my sub stack is going paid, so now we're going weekly. And and then you could just you could set a clock and like four months after that, you get the post from someone being like I'm going on hiatus. I feel burnt out. Like this is this has become too much. And so I think a little bit of what has happened is we the web is such a competitive environment um, and such a noisy one that we have all ex accelerated our output in a way that um, some people are truly amazing and can do that and can continue that at a high level. But I think for a lot of people, they've hit a wall of like this has become less fun. You know, this is like my hobby became my job. Oh no, I hate my job. <laughs> Does that mean I hate my hobby? Like, what does this mean? Um, and so I think that there is a, you know, I just think like the period of the past two years, we've just like gone so hard into online content production and promotion that I think a lot of people have reached uh, their limits. And, you know, everything about how the internet has been architected to date has really been a kind of a single player mode. Like any platform, has, they think of there being a single user on the other end of it. The notion of groups using tools together has not really been uh, a norm that any platforms have really thought about. Like even a Kickstarter, it's like, well, you're just supposed to share an email login, actually. Um, you know, like the concept of, of groups of people, of squads being some sort of unit that didn't make sense. But I think that with how the web has matured, with how online communities have matured to such a ridiculous degree, and the way that primitives of public ledgers, blockchains, the, the, you know, the structures of DAOs, the ways that people are able to align themselves being part of groups, I think that the nature of what a user is online is, is changing. And that we are more and more going to see all of our platforms evolve from just a single player mode to more of a group mode to where you're going to roll in with your member NFT that says you belong to these groups. And as a result, you will get access to certain things, different platforms, or your group will travel with you from platform to platform. You'll bring your permissions with you from one space to another. Uh, I think that where this results in this is more of a post-platform world than what we've had on, on the web in the last 10 years or so. Um, but I also think that, like to, to go back to the tweet you quoted, um, there's been a lot of attention put on like say DAOs the past year, like DAOs are gonna change the world. These, I, I've never bought into that at all. And I think that DAOs, and I even think that Web3, they're not, they're more the smoke than they are the fire. Like it's a, to me, it's a sign of how people are evolving. It's a sign of how technology has changed our relationships to each other. Like that's at the heart of this, um, that what it is to be a person now when so much of our lives are lived online just fundamentally changes who we are and how we relate to each other. And I think in some ways that the internet sparked those changes and now the internet is evolving to reflect those changes inside us. And like what we are wanting to build is a reflection of how the tools that we use have changed us. So I, there's a, like a bit of a self dialogue that I think is happening with the tools that we are creating. And so ultimately I see these things as having technical origins, but they are, it's really like responding to what our emotions, our feelings as people, what we want the things that make us feel safe, the things that make us feel vulnerable. And to me, the multiplayer mode, creating in a group with others, those are all like safer experiences than the feeling of being alone. And, and, I, and I think that technology is going to be able to do an even better job of fulfilling that desire and to answer that connection never as fully as 
our, our hearts and souls really need, but I think we'll, we'll speak more to that. Yeah, interesting, because I also saw that you um, tweeted something about RZA and the Wu-Tang Clan specifically, and how um, each member kind of took care of uh, the other artists. And in that sense, it kind of resembles the DAO structure or like the ideal of the DAO structure. So why do you think, are we as humans maybe um, repeating the same kind of patterns within Web3 and how can we how can DAOs maybe help, even though you, you said you're not like really a fan of it, but there must be like a structural way within technology to to really bring things forward. Well, I think like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a big, I've, I've always been skeptical of all the DAOs are going to change the world idea. I think online communities have already changed the world and will continue to, whether it's like the effective altruism community or whether it's Wall Street bets or whatever. There's like infinite, infinite examples of that. Um, to me, a DAO is like a specific technical structure that I don't think is that super meaningful. Uh, and 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 I also think that like like in, in a lot of ways, I think community is like a like the difference between a meta label and a DAO. A DAO is a group of people who all share the same token and hang out in the same Discord uh, and who theoretically vote to make decisions together, although I think very few people actually vote in DAOs. You know, a meta label is a group of people who have the same interest and who are releasing public work that expresses that interest. There is a there is a point to it. There is an output. Um, and so it's not just like a hang club, a social club. It is it has an intention behind it of like creating culture, driving things forward. Like in ancient times, the worst punishment you could give to someone would be to banish them from their community, right? Would be to say, you have to leave the village. That's, that was worse than death. Um, so I don't think that like the notion that we need to be connected to others is like any new discovery. I think that DAOs are part of a long line of things, but I don't, I don't know that I believe that in the long run, they're going to be that important. I, I think that the maturation of tools for online communities is super important you know I, I think that like online communities will shape the 21st century in the way that maybe the 20th century was shaped by companies or by governments i mean the 21st century is going to be more online communities are going to be doing that that is who is that is what is driving culture that's what's shaping culture and whether you're on reddit or discord or uh, a telegram or whatsapp like i I don't know that that venue matters so much, but it is true that, you know, um, say with snapshot or things like that, there's like tooling that's meant to make those communities slightly more structured. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's been happening for a long time and will just keep happening. Yeah. So meta label is a group of people um, using a common name for a shared purpose with a focus on public releases that manifest your POV and I think it really sounds like a DAO. I kind of want to hear from you like explicitly if you had to say two things, maybe three things that sets it up apart from a DAO. Because if I just got on LinkedIn or on your Twitter and I read it, I'm like, oh, is this, a, I would just assume it's a DAO because this is what we think a DAO should be or this is how we tend to describe what a DAO is, this common shared value. So what is it? How does it work? The difference is in public releases. So a DAO just says, are you interested in this? Come hang out in the Discord and you can just be in a social club. And what you choose to do together, like it doesn't really matter. It's like whatever you choose to do together is what happens. Uh, the intention of a meta label is to release culture. It is to make work. It is an artistic practice. So if you think about a record label, if you're a record label that never puts out any music, that's what a DAO is to me. <laughs> it's like, we all like music, so we all hang out together. Great, we all, we share music with each other. Great, um, that's cool. If you want to start like releasing new music, putting out music by other people or making music together and putting that into the world, that's where you would want uh, a label or a meta label. So I think that what's gonna happen is that many DAOs who currently have treasuries and are in discords and are voting on things to do together, that what, some DAOs may choose to do is they may say, actually, you know what we need to, we should be like creating culture that says what we're about and that like draws more people to us and that champions whatever, whatever causes are important to us. We should start, we need to start a label 
Uh, we need to start a label where we're, where we're, we're making and releasing work by people in our group, by other people we like, and we're using our resources to create cultural artifacts. So to me, like a label is about output. It's about making culture. The reason it exists is to make culture. To me, a DAO can never make anything. And I think uh. most DAOs <laughs> never make anything. <laughs> and I don't, and I think that's like, it's not wrong. It's not broken because that's not its intention. Right. Its intention is just to be together. Mm. And so I think it's just, what is the purpose of it? And so a label, it is, it is a cultural artistic practice. It's not a social practice. So how does the structure look like? So, you know, at least we know with DAOs, there's this onboarding and, uh, you know, there are all these steps and this concept of organizing, voting, coordinating. How does that, what's the functions like within a meta label? Well, you have a, you have a core group of the, the founders of a label. Um, and you can imagine them as like, maybe they're a group of people who uh, hold an NFT that gives them rights to a multi-sig, say to release treasury if they wish. Uh, a label would then create drops, put out work. Um, so they could make an album, they could release a video, they could publish those things. Uh, each release by a label will ha has its own smart contract that determines where the finances, the output of that project should go. Um, how a label chooses to structure itself internally is entirely up to them. Right now, we're working with a lot of collectives that already exist in the world. Some of those run as full holacracies. Some of those run as democracies. Some of those are creative dictatorships where there's a visionary and other people who support them and work with them. We are going to show some different norms for how groups and labels operate. So for example, in like punk music, uh, a good label deal is one where the creator always owns the rights to their work. The label puts up the production costs of the work and the profits are split 50-50 between the two entities. Um, so there's like different financial structures that exist depending on if you're in public, you know, book publishing or music or film. Um, and so we will allow groups, help groups design whatever system they wanna have. Um, but really it's that, it's that architecture for you as a group to create an identity, uh, for you to put out releases in a way that they're attributable to your label, to where all the contributors who are part of it um, are clearly reflected and financially benefit from a release. And it's just sim it's simply a structure for how groups of people can release things together. Um, and so you can imagine in a label, like each release is probably by someone different, right? It's not like the same people over and over, like the difference between a a substack and a label is like the it's a the authorship is going to change with each release most likely. So it, it's just basically a, a, a yeah an infrastructure for managing membership, managing catalogs and releases. And we see um, a very distinct set of primitives that would be incredibly useful for doing that. And yeah, and so you know, in this first year, we're right now we're working with existing labels, existing collectives, I'd say maybe half know what Web3 is and are native to Web3, half have no connection to Web3, and they've been making work as groups for uh, a while. And we're creating a universe where these projects, a lot of which like are, have been uncategorizable in our existing culture. It's like, what even is that? You know, a lot of these groups, they don't even know how to talk about themselves. So we're gonna create a context where uh, actually being a part of a collective, what it is, what it means to do, will be something that will become really obvious to people. So I, I experienced this with Kickstarter and crowdfunding to where before crowdfunding existed, it was like a three hour conversation to get someone to explain, understand what it was, like almost literally. Uh, and then once we made Kickstarter and showed them the page, it took them like five seconds to understand it. And then they would say, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> like I was, I was trying. It's just it's hard. It's hard with words. It's easy. It's easy with an experience. Um, so I feel confident that when when you see Meta Label, when you experience it as a creator or as an audience member, um, it's going to feel like it's always been here. Uh, it, it's it's that it's that kind of product. Um, but yeah, it, it's just it's just simple tools to let people uh, create work in groups and release work in groups. Amazing. And like circling back to this topic of, uh, you know, the creator economy, 
so meta levels are create creativity and multiplayer mode, right? And then I think you touched a bit on it, but I would like it if you could kind of like explain this further, but around this concept of the, how the creator economy impacts the future of work. I mean, I think like the, you know, the, the core action of like creator economy is like smash that subscribe button, you know, like follow me, follow me. I'm the star, follow me. And every single action we've taken online for like the last 15 years has basically had that intention. And, and I think what that results in is a really isolating and competitive internet where whether it's true or not, many of us feel like we're competing against each other. People who care about the same things feel like they're competing against each other to get people to care about something. And uh, it's, yeah, there's just this endpoint of like, follow me. That is kind of at the, the bottom line of any interaction online. And yeah, I, I think it's, it's like, kind of seems obvious and simple that that's how things should work. And it's hard to imagine anything other than that. Um, but I think it is possible to imagine something beyond that. And to me, what I, where I have gone, where my experiences have showed me is that the feeling of being a part of a group where you as an individual are not the center, but the purpose of your group is the center, you as a collective are the center, is just a very different emotional experience. We had an event yesterday within our Discord called Release Therapy, where we had different groups come in uh, and we just talked about what are the feelings of anxiety you have when you release things? Like, how do you deal with that? And we all had very similar feelings. And we all also shared that like, when we have done projects with other people, or when we're published by a publication, those feelings feel different. It feels less like I am demanding attention. I, as an individual, am asking you to like, pay me, follow me, do something for me. And, and, and instead it feels more generous and more like an ask and a give. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's just an emotional experience that is worthy of evolving and I think can be a better economic, emotional and creative outcome for people. I think how that relates to the future of work is, is interesting because I don't, I don't believe a, a, a meta label is a monogamous experience. I think it's like a polyamorous experience. I think that most people will be members of like five or six labels. You know, I do this kind of work with these people. I help out over here. I mean, like DAOs are not dissimilar, right? And I fully buy into a future being we don't have one employer. We have many employers and not even employers just like value generating groups of which we have different levels of membership. Um, and so I think that that is like a part of COVID that is really not going to go away. Um, and even is how we structured internally at MetaLabel, like we're structured as an egalitarian squad with no more than 12 full-time seats lifetime. And then we have a wider pool of liquid contributors, community contributors. Yeah, we just think there's so many great people who can add value to this project and they shouldn't have to work here 40 hours a week to do it. And also we should be able to distribute value to people who create value for this project, even if they don't work 40 hours a week here to do it. Um, and also that if you like start with those kinds of assumptions, then perhaps it's possible to create an organization that has a smaller footprint, that has uh, a lower headcount, that can be more fun, can be more creative. And also like you're not hit, hit, needing to hit such big revenue targets to be uh, operate in the black and to be a sustainable business. And so, you know, the world, the world we root for and are trying to work for is one where we can all be members of numerous groups that are all sustainable because they're, again, their footprint is pretty light. And, and that this is a way that like, in, in my life, some indie labels, like music labels, film labels, book publishers have been some of the most important institutions in my life that have shaped who I am. I feel the, the most important labels of the, that are gonna do that for the next decade, 20 years of people coming up. I think they're gonna be like digital native labels. I think they're gonna be new kinds of institutions of just a couple of people who have a different way of seeing the world and they have a powerful voice and this gives them a tool to do it. You know, I, Mischief is a project that we look at as like a great inspiration um, as, 
you know, to me like a apex, apex metal label in the world today where every other week mischief has another crazy drop. Um, no one knows what their drops are going to be, but the point of every mischief drop is to show how manipulative capitalism is by using manipulative capitalist tools. They're like always these ironic things that work. And that's like a, a, a language of their art that has shaped culture that continues to. And, and to me, that's like, if you're looking, if you're looking to, to shape how people see the world and you know, I, I don't know, I, I think it's just a great model to do it. We've spoken a lot about the creator economy and you know how there's so much value like online these days, everything is getting digitalized and artwork. And so whenever I think about the creator economy or Web3 disrupting the creator economy, I can't help but think about NFTs. Then I can't help but think about creative value and this concept of like hype around um, NFTs. So I want to know like, what's your thoughts? I know it's a bit far away from kind of like the overall topic we've been having so far, but in a way it's connected. So I want to know your thoughts behind like the hype around NFTs and should we be worried about the fact that uh, the potential to make like a ton of money is going to attract like all kinds of people who are not really invested in the health of like this new emerging ecosystem called Web3. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like you just described the last two years of crypto, uh, the right. people, attracting people who don't care about, I'm in some like WhatsApp chats with some NFT DGENs and there's not a lot of talk about the value of the art. There's a lot of talk about rarity qualities and sweeping the floor. And I, I personally think that um, I see crypto, Web3 and blockchain as being very distinct concepts. You know, a blockchain is a technical infrastructure. It is a public ledger. A public ledger to me is a neutral piece of technology that opens up a lot of interesting avenues. I see crypto, crypto meaning, cryptocurrency, uh, you know, defining, I think, this specific period of blockchain related projects to date. I think crypto is a first application space of public ledger product. Uh, I think that there is an after crypto. And I think that Web3 is after crypto. That crypto are projects whose entire point is the accumulation or trading of currencies or things that can be attributed to a cryptocurrency. To me, Web3 describes any tool that's built using the infrastructure of a public ledger. To me, there's like three, three pieces of technology that come with that public ledger that I can't unsee, that I think it is being distinct from crypto. One is that it creates a post-platform world where uh, you know, if you take any action on a Web3-enabled platform, most of those actions are going to result in something appearing in your wallet, which is something that you can carry with you from one platform to another and can open up a different experience somewhere else. So I think that post-platform world is something that happens as a result of the public ledger, not because of crypto, but because of all that underlying technology. Projects are able to distribute value, ownership, and influence beyond full-time employees. Never before on the web have people really given value ownership to their community. You know, how would you acknowledge a community in the past? It would be like a tote bag and a form letter, and that's about as much as you could do. Um, so again, the public ledger, the neutral technology, allows you to distribute ownership and influence beyond your walls. Unbelievably huge. And then the third thing that a public ledger does is it creates permanent agnostic storage. So like I've told my life story as I see it at like my personal website, whystrickler.com, which is hosted on Squarespace. And the second I stop paying Squarespace $144 a year to host that site, it will go away. Um, which means like once I die, if I didn't set up auto billing forever, like the story of my life will disappear. And it's that way for all of our outputs, all of our catalogs. You know, if you want to go look at like the glory days of MySpace or Vine online right now, you won't find them. It doesn't exist um, because we've relied on companies to store our data. And we've relied on, yeah, we just have had a very, very basic set of understanding. So again, in a public ledger enabled world, there's this ability for our lives, our histories uh, to be stored in a way that is agnostic, neutral. And so I think these, to me, these are the most meaningful things about Web3. It is post-platform, distributing ownership and influence and permanent agnostic storage. And to me, those things 
are the foundation for very different kinds of experiences. I think crypto elements and NFTs as a medium that's a part of that as like a native tool that exists for those things makes all makes all kinds of sense. And I'm like very, I, I, like, I think the future of the NFT as a medium is infinite. No shade on that structure at all. Crypto has created a very specific set of expectations and color around how we see this. But I think that there is an after crypto. I think there's an after crypto. And it's not that crypto goes away, but just that there, there is utility that exists beyond that. And maybe the legacy that comes out of these, like the, the, the bull run, the bubble of the past three years is that if you read books like uh, Carlotta Perez's, um, she has a great book about, about what happens when you invest in technology, but what happens in bubbles, people build out lots of infrastructure during bubbles that ends up being used for something else later on. And so I think that, yeah, so once again, I, I think that crypto is a first application for a public ledger enabled technological world but it's not the last. And, and to me, that, that's what I'm especially compelled in are the pieces that happen after crypto. Yancy, I, I want to know, like, what do you wish for the um, creative economy? Like, let's say we, you mentioned a lot of labels. So what do you hope for, like, the single creators out there? And maybe you can share the last few words with our community. And then we also would love to know where our community can find you on our, your social platforms. I want people to not feel alone. You know, I, I want I want people to feel like when they're publishing something, they're they're holding hands with three or four people who they respect and love, whose opinions they value highly. I want them to feel like there's a rush of people pushing them into the world. I want them to feel a sense of pride and connection and the work they make. And like that's what that's what creative work is meant to do for an audience. And you know, no one none none of us are promised an easy creative process. Like <laughs> that only rarely happens, but production processes, release processes, these, these are things that we can improve on. And, you know, just, just very much projecting my own personal experience, but one shared by my, my co-founders and collaborators in MetaLabel, like there, there's just such a different experience between doing something alone and, and doing it with people that you care about, or even, even different between doing it as a boss versus doing it as a collaborator is a very different experience. I, I think once people have, get to try this out, like once they get squad pilled, And I think it's going to become not the entirety of what people do, but I think most people will have a personal practice, probably where they do some things on their own every now and then, and then they have their group practice. And, and I think that what people are going to create in, in the group in, in multiplayer mode, be able to get something like the Headless Chaos project that came out of Song Camp this past week is an amazing example of what happens in that. I think that's more and more what we're going to see on the internet. And that's like, and that's what the web is all about. So I'm, I'm very, optimistic about the rise of the structure, whether meta label ends up being the term or not, um, because I think it speaks to something deeper uh, than just these technical tools. And it's just that the technical tools, I think, can match our desires and our emotions a bit better than they have in, in the recent past. Could you tell us what your criteria of choosing blockchain is? What do you consider? My hope is that post-merge, it's easy, it's an easy answer. <laughs> my my host is that post-merge, it's like, okay, ETH works, gas is not crazy, we can all feel good about this. Who knows whether that will end up being true? The criteria is it's funny. It's funny. Because right now there's a force, there's a trade of you go where the party's at, but it's expensive, or you try to save money, but you are raising the degree of difficulty and expertise needed to use your system. So we've explored a number of different chains, um, talked to a lot of a lot of the major chains. I think in the end, what we would like to do is launch on a post-merge ETH, knock on wood, if that's possible. But yeah, it's, you know, it's like the, all the L1s is like a sign of the wide openness of the space here in the early going, uh, which I think is like a healthy thing. It's also a bit of a challenge for the growth of the space too, just in that I think it's hard to know. And maybe people get themselves tied up in like, what is the right way to go? And so, you know, having talked to different L1s, L2s, you know, I feel like, I feel like kind of the lesson is like, friends don't let friends launch on side chains. Um, it's, just, it's just, it's just a lot harder, but you're choosing where do you want to trade your hard, you know, because what's hard about ETH is gas and, you know, and proof of work. And, uh, you know, and you worry about being a tiny fish in a giant pond. But 
it's hard. You know, I just kind of want, I just want to be the dumb internet consumer that lets other people make this decision for me, <laughs> where you're just like, I just do what everyone else does. Like, that's just, that's my instincts. Thank you, Yancy. I think people would like to follow you. So if you could, and just check out what you're working on, if you could share your social uh, media platforms, it would be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just whystrickler.com is my personal site, uh, at least until I die, and then it'll go away. Uh, and then at Twitter, I'm whystrickler. So just my first initial, my last name. And MetaLabel is at metalabel.xyz. And we have new drops on a monthly-ish basis. So come check us out. Thank you so much, Yancey, for this well-articulated, insightful, informative. I mean, I don't even know which words to use inspiring. It was really great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Joy. And thank you all for being a part of today's forum. If you want to get more involved in our community, make sure to follow us on our social platforms. IG is newcoin.nco and our website is newcoin.org. We will have all the links um, in the description below, including our Discord and a link to our private Telegram group. And um, yeah, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. And we will see you in the next episode. Thank you.